now we come up with another beast, one that follows right here on the heels of it. Revelation 13, verse 11. Okay, so we're still on page 1183. Then I saw another beast coming up where? Out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. The question is, who is this second nation? Because it's a beast, so we know it's a nation. There's a lot that's said about the first nation or the first beast that we started out with, but here's another one. So who could it be? We see that it doesn't come up out of the sea, so it's different this time. It doesn't come up out of the sea. Do you remember what that prophetic symbol meant? Sea. Yeah. It means, right, people, nations, uh, multitudes of people. But this beast comes up out of the earth. Relatively speaking, it comes up in a part of the earth that is unpopulated, or at least um, not densely. It's sparsely populated, okay, in comparison to the, the, the multitudes and the languages and the peoples of this, that are represented by the sea. This is the opposite. This is coming up more sparsely populated. It's less, um, what do I want to say, um, organized and been around for, uh, you know, a long time, okay? So, when does it rise? Let's get a timing on this. It has to be somewhat recently because remember the flow of nations. You had Babylon, you got Medo Persia, you've got the Greeks, and you have the Empire of Rome. The Empire of Rome came to its end roughly around 476 AD. Okay, so you got the time frame in mind. Then it broke apart into 10 nations, right? Nations of modern Europe, okay? And then a little horn came up, displacing three of those original 10 European nations, all right? And we know that that took place, um, and that little horn had its reign from about 538 A.D. to 1798, 1260 years. So we're looking for this next beast to rise up sometime around there. Sometime after this little horn power um, comes up. All right? So again, we're looking in Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. It's interesting that it says that. The word lamb is used in the book of Revelation more than two dozen times. But every single time, except this one, it's a reference to Jesus. And we're told that it has two horns like a lamb. This would indicate, I believe, that this nation in some way is like Christ. It is Christ-like, and that's important you'll also notice that this nation is not wearing a crown. The sea beast, with its seven heads and ten horns, has crowns, which indicates monarchy. This one is absent crowns. So this power that we're looking for doesn't have a, a monarchy, and that's very significant. What we're seeing here is that there's no kingly authority. This nation in some way, stands for freedom. So here's what we do know so far. The nation rises in a part of the world that is sparsely populated. It's a young nation. There is no monarchy. There's no king, okay? And it assumes, as we continue to read on in the chapter, it assumes a position of worldwide power and influence. It has the authority to make the inhabitants of the world worship the first beast, okay? So it is a powerful nation. Interestingly enough, if you're paying attention, this lamb beast is also different than the others because all the other beasts are predatory. Leopard, lion, bear, dragon, those are all predators. The lamb beast is what? Pray. 
It's, it's not a predatory uh, power. It is uh, like Christ um, in its gentleness, at least initially. Okay? The United States, when it arose, it was known as the New World. That's how it was referred to, the New World. It was a haven for those who were escaping religious persecution primarily in Europe. And it was founded on twin freedoms, freedom of government, the civil power, and freedom of religion, freedom of of, of faith, okay? Those are the the, the two basic pillars of the republic known as the United States, okay? Now, according to the Bible, and we say this not with any sense of glee or disrespect because I would imagine that all of us here as Americans, whether you were born here or whether you immigrated here, love this country, love this nation, and enjoy the the freedoms that it provides. Okay? We can say amen to that. We love that. Okay? So it, it doesn't come with any sense of joy that I tell you that according to the Bible, a change comes over this lamb-like nation. Something happens to change the heart of it. How do we know that? Well, again, Revelation 13, verse 11, it has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. Okay? Who's the dragon? Satan, how do you know that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So that's on the page just right opposite, if you're in Seminar Bible, 1182, okay? Revelation 12, verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So three names for Satan there. Serpent, dragon, devil. All of it referring to Satan. So this lamb-like, Christ-like nation that comes up with no king, not a monarchy, and is founded on the principles of freedom of government and freedom of religion has a change. Something takes place and it begins to speak like Satan himself. Okay? How do we know what's going to take place? How is it that a nation speaks. How does a nation talk? How does a nation speak? Well, we know that a nation speaks through its laws. Its laws are a reflection, right, of its, of its character, okay? So when you see a nation that has unfair draconian laws, then you know that it tells you something about the heart of that nation, okay? And we can name plenty of nations around the world whose laws, right, are unjust, unfair. They cause heartache. They cause suffering. um, All kinds of things like that. Okay? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speaketh. It speaks. So what comes out of your mouth is a reflection of what's in your heart. Okay? Okay? And a lot of times, you know, people will say things and then later they'll, they'll try to take it back, right? Say, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that or that was off the record or whatever. The problem is, is that the Bible is true. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it comes out of your mouth, even in an unguarded moment, it means it was in there. You may not have wanted it to come out, right? You may have wanted to filter it or or somehow choose the company that it came out in. But if it came out of your mouth, it was in there. And so in the same way, this, this nation that now is speaking as a dragon, it is speaking out of the context of its character. So there's been a fundamental change in its character. Okay, so let's continue on. Revelation 13, verse 12. 
talking about this same lamb beast that speaks like a dragon. It says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast, that's the sea beast, he exercises all of the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, there's a lot we could say and unpack about this, but I'm not going to say everything I could say because that's for tomorrow night. See, you got to come back for tomorrow because I'm going to unpack this um, even further tomorrow night. And there's a lot to say here. It's really good. Okay? But this nation is going to grow in power and prestige and prominence to the place where it's able to use its authority to place that first nation back in a position of power. Understand that. That first sea beast suffered a deadly wound. So for a time, it was ruling the roost. It tripped up, had a deadly wound. That wound was healed. And now this second beast that rises up uses its unrivaled authority and power. It's the sole superpower to prop up that first beast so that the first beast comes back fully to its place of prominence. Okay, so think about that. There's a partnership between the sea beast and the lamb beast, okay? So we try to understand how could this happen? How might this happen? How a nation that stands for freedom might one day use its power to affect freedom in a negative way. With freedom, right, there comes responsibility. God gave us freedom of choice, and with that freedom of choice comes great responsibility. In this country, for instance, you are free to learn how to drive a car. But we expect you, right, we trust that you won't use your car to mow down people on the sidewalk. In this country, you're free to learn how to fly a plane, but we trust that you won't use that freedom to fly that plane into a building. In this country, under the Second Amendment, you are free to possess firearms, but we trust that you won't use that freedom, right, to mow down civilians from a hotel window, okay? With freedom comes great responsibility. With freedom, there's always a risk involved that people might use their freedom in a negative way. Is that right? Again, that's why the tree is in the garden. There is a risk that the human beings could choose to distrust God and bring upon themselves and the universe untold misery. That's a risk. That's the risk of freedom. Okay? So, the United States was once the haven for those who wanted to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. All right? With nobody burning them at the stake or, you know, torturing them on the rack for the beliefs that they held or didn't hold. It was a haven of safety for those people. However, we have noticed, you all have noticed, a shift in society, right? There's a great deal less respect for God and biblical principles. We know this, okay? What was once taboo, we know, is celebrated. We know that. It's true of the entire Western world that essentially anything goes. Everyone does what's right in his own mind, okay? And we see that. We talked about that last Sabbath, that when you turn away from the light, if the word of God is the light, if you reject that light, the only place you can go is darkness, right? So we see the evidence of that, okay? No sense in going on and on about it. We see that. Sin is often defended by what people misguidedly refer to as freedom of expression. And that goes all kind of ways. Okay? We don't even react to the things that long ago were considered scandalous. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin 
is a reproach to any people. When a nation is down or an individual is down, the best thing to do would it be to repent and turn to God. Isn't that right? Okay, and embrace God's principles again, come back into the light. It is likely, as we look at the Bible, that what is about to happen is that this nation will attempt to turn to God, but in so doing will actually be turning away from God. Now let me ask you, has anything before been done in the name of God that was actually turning away from God. Can you think of any? Hmm? The Crusades. That's a good example. Yeah, the Inquisition. What, what was that? The Holocaust. Slavery. Yeah. How about the crucifixion of Jesus? That was done in the name of God, right? Jesus was considered the blasphemer. And he had to die for the sins of the nation. But in fact, they were actually crucifying the Son of God. So we, we, we have examples of people who do things in the name of God who actually are working at cross purposes against God. We have those examples, okay? And as we look in the Bible, we see that there is a move to lead people to return to God's ways, but in so doing, the pendulum swings and actually people are influenced away from God instead of towards him. Something happens to this freedom-loving country that we all love that causes all who love this nation to shake our heads in disbelief, even as the disciples must have done when Jesus foretold the future of their beloved temple. Can you imagine? I've tried to, I've tried to compare that. Because... It's hard for us to understand the, 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 the role, the significance of the temple in Jewish life. I don't, I don't know if we have anything other than the capital itself that would compare. Um, and Jesus stood there and, you know, look at this temple. Look at the beautiful stones. They were proud of it. Just like we would be proud of the capital. And Jesus says there's coming a day when there's not going to be one stone left on another. You can imagine the shock. And it's the same kind of reaction we have when we, when we look at this power and recognize that a, a fundamental change is, is coming. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay? He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, this is interesting because now it's introduced the idea of an image. It's an image to the beast. Which beast? The first one, the sea beast. Okay? That the image of the beast should both speak... It's going to speak to and cause as many as would not worship the image to be what? To be killed. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark. We're going to talk about this tomorrow night. A mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell, that's economic sanctions, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Wow. How in the world does the lamb beast become this? How does it speak as a dragon? Well, it does this through the hallmark of all false religion. And that's this, the language of Babylon and the language of Babylon is force and coercion. That's how it speaks as a dragon. Through force and coercion. Gone is that freedom to choose. That freedom goes away. And now a certain form of worship is enforced. And that is Babylonian language. 
if this prophecy is true and the interpretation is correct, there will have to come a time when this country breaks down, listen, the wall of separation between church and state and becomes a persecuting power that will form an alliance with the sea beast enforcing its worship on everyone else. Listen, pay very close attention to the language that is being spoken in evangelical Christianity. I'm not telling you to listen to what's being spoken in secular society. I'm not telling you to listen to what the atheists are saying or the liberals are saying or anybody else like that. No, pay attention to what evangelical Christians are saying. Because the language that I've heard for years now, probably since the 80s, and you've heard it too, is that the separation of church and state was never intended by our founding fathers. That the separation of church and state, right, is being misinterpreted. That instead of freedom of religion... It's freedom from religion, right? And they're going through great lengths in the Christian right to interpret the foundings of our nation as if it was all along their intention to make this a Christian nation. When in fact, It was a nation that was founded on religious freedom so that you could come here and not be persecuted for your beliefs. Okay? It is the freedom of religion. You can believe what you want to believe and you won't be hassled here. Okay? And so what happens is that that wall of separation is being attacked. And it's not being attacked from the liberals. It's being attacked from the conservatives. They want to see that wall come down. The problem is is that when the wall of separation comes down, what happens? Persecution. Totalitarianism. It has happened every time. And that's exactly what the founders of this nation were trying to prevent. Because every other time that religion and the state come together and form an alliance, they shake hands, they're in it together, church and state, you've got the Inquisition. You've got persecution. So they didn't want that. They put a wall there. And that wall has protected us from those kinds of things. But it is now being attacked. The language is changing. Okay? And what about that sea beast who received the fatal wound? Last time we checked on the papacy, it was about the year 1798. Now remember, keep in mind the timing of the rise of this this power. Because it has to come after the little horn power. Okay? So about the time that the little horn power is receiving its wound in 1798... What nation is coming on the scene? The United States. The Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. So about the same time as one is going down, the little horn is going down, the sea beast is going down, here comes this new nation. And by the way, when the United States was originally formed, the Catholic Church was not impressed. The Catholic Church actually mocked the idea of religious freedom. They mocked it openly. Okay? So there was no, there was no love lost there between uh, Rome and this, the new nation that was rising. Because they said, freedom of religion, what's that? And of course they would say that, right? 
because they're the ultimate representation of church and state coming together and being a persecuting power. So they were very much against religious freedom. That's important. You need to know that because of what happened just two years ago when Pope Francis came to the United States. There was some symbolism there that if you weren't aware of what was going on, it was huge. Pope Francis in Philadelphia um, was given the opportunity, was given the privilege of standing and delivering his speech from Abraham Lincoln's podium. And And that is significant because when Abraham Lincoln stood at that same podium years ago, and declared religious freedom in this nation. The Pope, at the time, was saying, "Uh uh-uh, no way. And so the fact that Pope Francis, all these years later, comes back and is able to stand at Lincoln's podium where before the Catholic Church was against religious freedom and then proclaim religious freedom That's a huge turnaround. The symbolism is not to be missed. There is a change in the two nations. Okay, let me wrap this up. Medieval church was wounded, but by 1929, you know this, Mussolini decided to end the so-called Roman question. What was the Roman question? That was the political dispute between the Italian state and the Roman Catholic Church over who was in control. And so the Lateran Treaty was signed by Benito Mussolini for the Italian government and by Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Gaspari for the papacy and confirmed by the Italian Constitution of 1948. Upon ratification of the Lateran Treaty, the papacy recognized the state of Italy with Rome as its capital. Italy, in return, recognized papal sovereignty over the Vatican City, a minute territory composed of 109 acres and secured full independence for the Pope. In the um, San Francisco Chronicle, dated February 11, 1929, it says this, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was a was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document healing the wound extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides did you catch the language healing the wound papal power has been on the rise ever since this treaty was signed Here in America, there was a time when Catholics were the ones who were persecuted. The Virginia House of Burgesses provided that thereafter no, quote, popish uh, recusants were to hold office in the colony and that any priest entering its borders was to leave immediately on being warned by the governor. Catholics were likewise disenfranchised and threatened with other persecution. Now, is there any evidence that these two powers, one Protestant, one Catholic, any evidence of them mending fences and working together? I mentioned one to you just a few moments ago. You'll remember this back when Ronald Reagan and John Paul II um, came together, right, to overthrow communism. That was one. Then President, first, first President Bush Uh, at his uh, State of the Union address, January 29, 1991, said this, it is a big idea, a new world order. Only the United States has both the moral standing and means to back it up. John Paul II, at the World Day of Peace, New Year's Day, 2004, said this, people are becoming more and more aware of the need for a new international order. And then this quote from Thomas Melody, Um, U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, um, 1989 to 1993, he says, I believe that the United States as the world's only superpower and the Holy See as the only worldwide moral political sovereignty have significant roles to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. And now listen to this. Daily Telegraph, May 13, 1999, quote, 
Disagreement about the extent of the Pope's authority was one of the main causes of the English Reformation in the 16th century. If a new united church was created, it would be the Bishop of Rome who would exercise a universal primacy. The Pope was recognized as the overall authority in the Christian world by an Anglican and Roman Catholic commission yesterday, this was written in 1999, which describes him as, quote, a gift to be received by all the churches. And then you remember in late 19, uh, 2014, the late Episcopal Bishop, Tony Palmer, addressed a gathering of charismatic evangelicals and leaders at Kenneth Copeland's um, World of Faith, Word of Faith Movement Convention. And at that convention, Tony Palmer declared Luther's protest over. Indeed, even as the world prepares to mark the 500th anniversary of the nailing of the 95 Thesis to the wall, there are, in just five days from now, by the way, there are many voices calling for the gulf between Protestantism and Catholicism to be bridged. That bridge went a long way in getting crossed in 2015 when Pope Francis came to the United States and addressed a joint session of Congress. Never been done before. And we ask ourselves, where is all of this headed? According to Scripture, it's headed to a place none of us want to go. Error 666, a mark of some kind, which we'll talk about tomorrow night. Has God blessed America? Yes, he has. We sing God bless America, but we need to pray that America blesses God. A Christian nation? Well, the Bible identifies only one such thing as a Christian nation. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You're it. The church is the only Christian nation, the true hope of the world. And if you're an American and you love this country, then you let your light shine. Not in partisan politics, as if one party were the Messiah as opposed to the other, but in the power of the Holy Ghost, as if Jesus Christ is Messiah, which he is, and Lord. Don't become beastly in your proclamation of the gospel. Too many Christians become beastly as they try to proclaim the word of God. Don't do it. Too many are speaking like a dragon while professing to follow the Lamb. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. It calls for us to spend time studying God's Word. When we don't study God's Word, we fall prey to the deceptions of the dragon's words, which are lies, half-truths accompanied by lying wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect of God. We have a privilege down here in the close of time to stand for God. It's a privilege and a blessing. And we wonder sometimes, are we going to be able to do it? Am I holy enough? Am I strong enough? Well, those are the wrong questions. Because the question is not, am I able? The question is, is he able? And yes, he is able. You remember, three Hebrew boys went into the fire. But God was able. He protected them. Daniel went into a lion's den. And again, God was able. The Hebrews were exiting Egypt, headed towards the promised land, and Pharaoh's army caught up to them from the rear, and there was a Red Sea in front of them. Where were they going to go? Again, God was able. They wandered in the wilderness. They had nothing to eat but manna. They had manna on the ground, water coming out of a rock for them to drink because he was able. The blind cried out. The lame, they couldn't, they couldn't walk. The dead needed to be raised. Jesus was able. And Jesus is able today. Amen? Amen? The only thing he cannot do or will not do is force your will. He will not do that. Because his kingdom is based on freedom. 
on liberty. We're coming to a time of great crisis, a time of spiritual crisis in the world. And the question is, who will have your heart? Who will have your allegiance? Who will have your, your love? Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it comes down to. You can trust Jesus with all your heart and your life today. If he has all of you, then you can rejoice. I want you to remember tonight that God is good. He's all-powerful. Jesus Christ died for you. He rose for you, ascended for you, and one day he's coming back for us, right? In power and great glory. One, I I love this quote from... um, Oh, don't, don't, don't do that to me, brain. Charles, um, Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, from the Nixon White House years, after his conversion, he said, the kingdom of God does not come on Air Force One. Amen. It's a reminder that our allegiance, our loyalty, right, our life, our love, our passion, is not to be wrapped up in an earthly kingdom that is passing away, but is to be with Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming to establish his kingdom that will never end. And you and I have been called to be citizens of that kingdom if we trust him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the United States of America. And as long as the light and lamp of freedom burns... We have the opportunity to come together in this place, unmolested, open the scriptures and study them for what they are and not have to worry about being hauled off to jail. You raised up this country, Lord, to ensure that the gospel would go to all the world and then the end would come to send missionaries around the globe. And we know that the shadows are lengthening, the light is fading, the nature of this nation that we love is changing. We don't say that or even study it with any glee other than to know that the end is near and that soon we can go home with you. But... While there is still light, Lord, help us to use our freedom wisely to study your word, to share it with others, to point them to Jesus, and then to make our own calling and election sure. Help us to study your word, Lord, not let it collect dust so that we are not um, in line to receive the mark or to be deceived by the lies and have truths that will be told in your name. We will know your name and we will know your voice because we have heard your voice in your word. So help us to take advantage of that. And tonight, if we still have yet to make a decision for you, then I pray, Father, for the strength to make that choice and to make that decision, to make it decisively and let it be permanent. Thank you, Lord. Bless us, bless our nation, bless its leaders, bless all of us, Lord, as citizens, and may we reflect you, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.